to Jude, if you would. Open your Bibles to Jude, and we're going to begin in verse 4. Jude, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that your word would be preached clearly. Give us hearts to believe it, to set aside our own opinions, but to believe what you have recorded in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we saw in, in Jude 4 that there are folks that crept into the, the kingdom church unawares. And we looked at Galatians 2, and there were folks that crept into the Galatians church the same way. The, the idea is, is, is simply this. Uh, get with me Acts 20, if you would. You, you need to understand the church is always under spiritual attack. And the idea is, is simply this. 2 Corinthians 4 tells you that Satan is the god of this world. With Satan as the god of this world, in other words, who the world worships, and Satan being the father of lies, what he's trying to do is he perceives the saved people as his adversary, and he's always in the process of attacking and trying to destroy the church. Look with me, if you would, at Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Go up to verse 25, if you would. What's going on in this section of Acts 20 is Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders. And he's giving them some encouraging words because he realizes he's never going to see them again. Look with me at verse 25. Now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Now notice verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And so what, what's being described in Acts 20 is that the church faces both internal danger and external danger from those that would attack it. And the design is to corrupt grace. In other words, you're saved by grace through faith apart from works the moment you believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins. And so that doctrine is always going to be under attack. Let me give you a, a couple examples. When you think of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So very clear, you're saved by grace through faith, and you're saved apart from works. Okay? If you add to that Romans 11.6, so let's think about Romans 11.6. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. Listen, if you ever wanted to memorize a tongue twister, that's the one you should memorize. Sally sells she shells by the seashore. It won't do you any good, <laughs> right? but knowing that verse will help. Now here's what I want you to get. If Romans 11.6 is correct, which it is, what happens if you take grace and you add just a little bit of works to it? It ceases to be grace, right? And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. In other words, when you add works to grace, you contaminate it. You render it useless. 
I would argue this. What you see today in modern Christendom is you see the simplicity, the purity of grace attacked across multiple fronts. So for example, there are denominations that will teach, you have to be water baptized to be saved. If you are not water baptized, you're not saved. Others won't say that it's that. They'll say that it's speaking in tongues. The true evidence of being saved is speaking in tongues, they'll say. There's multiple examples of this. One that I'll pick that I think is a, a widespread one that's a problem is the idea of lordship salvation. The idea of lordship salvation is this. The way that you get saved today is that you have to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life in all aspects. In other words, you have to yield every facet, every part of your life to Him to be saved. And that's simply salvation by works. Listen, if, if you're saved by making the Lord the Lord of all aspects of your life, do you really do that? Is He the Lord of your driving life? Right? I mean, what I'm getting at is salvation is not you turning over a new leaf and quitting all the bad habits in your life. Now, should you do that? You should do that. But salvation is not based upon that. And just to prove the point, what would happen if I said, here's your homework assignment? For the next week, I just want you to record every thought that you have and then come in next week and we'll take turns reading them aloud to the audience. Is there anyone that would have the audacity to do that? And doesn't that prove that if, if, you, if you think that you're going to please God because you've cleaned up all areas of your life, you're not being honest, right? You're just not. So the problem with Lordship Salvation is that what it's doing is essentially teaching works. What you have to do is you have to yield every aspect of your life to Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Let me make the point another way. If you tell someone the gospel is making Christ the Lord of, the, of their life, honestly, that's just foolish talk. Jesus Christ is already the Lord of Lords. You didn't make Him that, and you can't not make Him that. You follow me? He's the Lord of everything, whether anyone likes it or not. Salvation is not making Him Lord. Salvation is believing on the blood that He shed. Now, I give you those examples. So some people teach you got to be water baptized to be saved. Some people teach you have to speak in tongues to be saved. Others teach lordship salvation. Others teach you got to live by the golden rule or keep the law. What, what you need to understand is here's what's going on. The gospel is the simplicity of you're not saved by any work. You're saved by grace through faith in a moment. But what you th see throughout Christendom it's like a Baskin Robbins of contaminated ice cream. There's all these different flavors that contaminate the truth and thus render the gospel of no effect. What I want to convince you of is this. You may not, it may not feel like you're in a spiritual war because no one is here throwing rocks at you, right? You can go, you can walk around wherever you want. You don't really suffer persecution of any description in the West, okay? You just don't. That, that, that is historically unusual, right? We live in, a, in an environment, in a society, and in a time that is very different. But don't be misled. The truth is still under spiritual attack. The gospel is still being corrupted by the constant effort to add works to it. I'll give you another example. The Word of God itself is under attack. So look with me at Mark chapter 1. Now you know as well as I do that of course there's always people saying the Bible is false and the Bible has errors and that'll never go away. People always say that. Now they can of course never prove any, of the, any such thing, of course, because it doesn't contain errors, but people always say that. But what I want to give you is I want to give you an example 
that just shows that the Word of God itself is being corrupted by people that publish it. So look with me at Mark chapter 1, verse 2. We could spend hours on this. I'm going to give you one example. Mark chapter 1, verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, plural. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. What the King James Bible does in Mark 1 verse 2 is it says, as it is written in the prophets, and then in verse 2 it quotes Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, and in verse 3 it quotes Isaiah 40 verse 3. So when in the first part of verse 2 it says, as it is written in the prophets, plural, it's a very specifically correct statement because it's about to quote two different prophets. So it's perfectly accurate. What modern versions do, New American Standard, New International Version, Message, the Good News Bible, I could go down the list, is they change Mark 1 verse 2 to say, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. And it is just flat out wrong. So think about that. What, in other words, what's happening is some of the most commonly published Bibles today have changed the text of the KJV so that it has errors in it. The Word of God is under attack. That's not an improvement. Now, by the way, what people will say is what the modern versions do is they take those old archaic words and put them in new words, but they mean the same thing. That is a bald-faced lie. Is the phrase, as it is written in the prophets, so archaic that you don't know what that means? It's not, right? I mean, it's just a flat-out lie. Look with me at Matthew 5. I started on this, and the problem is I could go on this forever, so at some point I'm going to have to quit, but I don't know when that will be. So, Matthew 5, verse 22. Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That's a true statement. That if you're angry without a cause, that's a sin and you're in danger of judgment. So completely, utterly true. What the modern versions do is they leave out the phrase without a cause. So now read that, leaving that phrase out. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. What's the immediate problem? Get Mark 3. Look at Mark chapter 3. Mark 3 verse 5 is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he had looked round about on them with what? Anger. Did the Lord Jesus Christ get angry? Of course he did. He said to the Pharisees that they made his father's house a den of merchandise, right? It was a den of thieves and robbers. He threw them out. He made the little whip and whipped them. He, he was clearly angry. Mark 3, 5 tells you that. But his anger was a righteous anger. It was an anger that had a legitimate cause, right? So when Matthew 5, 22 in the modern versions leaves out without a cause, it makes the Lord Jesus Christ in danger of judgment, which is ridiculous. Get 1 Corinthians 1. Maybe a couple more. 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1, verse 18. 
I'll read this to you the way it's framed in the modern versions. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are being saved, it is the power of God. So what the modern versions do is it refers to people who are being saved as if it's an ongoing process. Is that the way salvation works today? You realize that when you phrase it that way, it's a corruption of the gospel. Because there's no such thing today as being saved. You either is or you is not, right? You're either lost or you believe the gospel and in an instant you were saved, but there's no such thing as being saved as a process. The whole being saved teaches works, right? So it's just a small little thing, right? It just inserted a being verb in the verse, but it changed the meaning of it, and it corrupted what the Word of God actually says. Get 2 Corinthians 2. I'll stop with this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'll, I'll read this to you in the terminology the modern versions use. For we are not as many which peddle the Word of God. Now the correct word there is corrupt. So what the modern versions do is they corrupt the verse that tells you not to corrupt the Word of God, which is sort of obnoxious. Because peddling simply means selling. And by the way, there's nothing wrong. The people that print Bibles and then sell them, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, they have to make, they have to make enough profit to stay in the business of printing. So it's not, peddling is not the issue. What, what happens in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, is the people that are busy corrupting the Word of God change the verse that criticizes what they're doing. Now, I tell you all that. Here's the point I'm just trying to make. You just need to understand, you need to, to face this reality. As a saved person, you are in a spiritual war. It may not seem like it because people aren't shooting at you with actual bullets. But the fact of the matter is the truth is under attack. The very Word of God that is your source of authority is under attack. There are new versions printed each year claiming to be better than what is the, the authority, right? And they're drawing people away from it, away from the truth. Just as the Word of God is under attack, the Gospel itself is under attack because people are teaching works as a way to contaminate what the Word of God actually says. All right, go back to Jude 4 with me if you would. Jude chapter 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, just to be clear, when it says that they were ordained to this condemnation, it's not saying that God ordained this individual soul to go to hell and that one to go to heaven. That's not what it's saying. But what God did is God knew that there would be attacks upon His church. He always knew that. He understood that. And what God has designed to do, look with me at Matthew 13. Look with me at Matthew 13. Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verse 30. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And if you recall the parable of the tares, what happens is there's the good field and there's wheat sowed in the field, but then there's an enemy that comes in and sows tares in the field. And what happens is as the field grows up, it has both the good wheat and the tares. And it's a parable that's a parable of the kingdom church. Uh, and, the, and the concept simply being that what happens, this is, this is something that's true transdispensationally, in, in any church, in any uh, called out group of saints, there's going to be the good wheat 
and there's going to be the tares. And so that's what Jude is warning about. That's what Galatians is warning about. Look with me at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. As you recall, Revelation 19 deals with the second coming, the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Revelation 20 then deals with the setting up of His kingdom. Look with me at Revelation 20, verse 2. Let's start in verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Let's just focus on what verse 2 is telling us. You know what Satan is doing today, according to Revelation 20, verse 2? He's deceiving the nations. So to give you one example of that, what was Satan when he was originally created? And the, the typical answer is he was an angel. But of course, that's not true. Satan was not created as an angel. Satan was created as a cherub. Then you say, well, okay, well, a cherub's the same thing as an angel. It's just a little baby with wings, right? That's not what a cherub is in the Bible. When you read the book of Ezekiel, a cherub is this remarkable creature. It has wings, and it has arms, and it has four different faces. And it has the face of a lion, a man, an eagle, and what Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 describe as either the face of a cherub or the face of an ox. And so when you look at Ezekiel, it's pretty clear that this cherub creature, this amazing creature that it is, has some, character, some characteristics that are very ox-like. Now you remember Genesis 3. God pronounces a curse upon Satan. Do you remember what that curse is? Do you remember? Look at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord, uh, verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Hasn't that ever struck you as strange? Why did he curse them above all cattle? Why not above all kangaroos? Why not above all waterfowl? Why all cattle? Hmm. Well, let me ask you this. In, in the time of the Exodus, when Moses is up on the mount and he doesn't come down for a while, what does Aaron do? Remember how he builds that molten aardvark? What does he do? He builds a molten calf. So what's going on with all this? So you can decide for yourself. Here's what I think is going on. Satan is not originally created as an angel. It's very clear from Ezekiel 28 that he's the anointed cherub that covereth. So he's created as a cherub. And the cherub creature itself has some characteristics that are very ox-like, very cattle-like. So when Satan comes down to earth and deceives Adam and Eve, and the Lord pronounces a curse upon him, it's appropriate to curse him above all cattle because a cherub is very cattle-like in nature. When Aaron creates the molten calf, what is he doing? Who's he paying homage to? Satan, isn't he? Now, you know what's fascinating? 
Are there places on earth, big places, where people think cows are holy? Right? It's an, it's an English expression, right? Holy cow! What's going on there? That's part of the satanic deception of the nations. You remember when we were in Revelation 20? What did it, how did it describe Satan? It described him, among other things, as a dragon. Right? Are there parts of the world where you can find dragons as a predominant theme in their architecture? Sure there are. There are some restaurants you go to, and there'll be a horoscope, and one of the years will be the year of the dragon. Now, what's the point of all that? The point of all that is this. If you think that the thinking of the world just randomly happens, and there's not an evil design to it, I would tell you you're missing what's going on. There's clearly an evil design to it. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. So the world has a course to it. It's like a body of water. Notice, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. Notice this. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What Ephesians 2 is telling you is that Satan has influence over the course of this world so that it flows a certain direction and its thinking reflects the thinking that he wants it to have. Of course, Scripture describes him as the father of lies. And if it, 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 let me just say it this way. You need to understand, it, you know, it's just sort of the reality of it. Most news on the earth has always been fake news. Right? And for the simple reason that Satan is the father of lies. He is the God of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So if you expose yourself to the media of this world, as we all do on a daily basis through television and magazines and newspapers and so on, you just have to understand the vast majority of the information that comes to you it's going to have an agenda to it. And whose agenda is it? Well, it's not the agenda of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be full of nonsense and half-truths and falsehoods, and, but they're designed to lead people in a certain direction. I'll share with you one thing that's fascinating to me. So as you think of the typical science fiction movie, there's a running theme that aliens from outer space are the bad guys, right? Invasion of the Body Snatchers, War of the Worlds, V, Alien Nation. I'm so dated, all the movies I know are like 20 years old, right? But isn't there a common theme that what happens is we as Earthlings need to band together to fight the bad guys from outer space that want to invade? Common theme, you've seen that. No, no one can miss that. Now think with me, think for a minute. What is the real truth? The truth is this. During Daniel's 70th week, the world comes under the sway of the beast and the false prophet. Revelation specifically says the whole world wondered at the beast. And what happens is the earth is under the sweat the sway of the devil himself and it needs an outside deliverer from heaven to come set it free that's the truth think about that that's what really goes on it, 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 
is the earth during the tribulation have great human leadership and it leads earthlings to band together to do good? Or is it the exact opposite? It's the exact opposite. The earth is under the influence of an evil despotic tyrant. And what it needs is it needs someone external to that to come back and set things right. Now you decide this for yourself. What I would tell you is what you see is you see the media, the movies, the common thinking of man, all consistent with, with information, with thought, with the zeitgeist, there I've used a big word, all flowing in one direction and helping people adopt the same philosophical mindset so that they will do what the God of this world wants them to do. That's what that is. It's all contrary to scriptural truth, but that's just the way that things work. So go back to Revelation 20. And let's go back to this wheat and tares concept for a minute. If you recall what Matthew 13 said about the wheat and the tares, it said that God would allow them both to grow together, and at the time of the harvest, He would separate them. Well, what happens at the second coming is Satan is bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, so he can't deceive the nations. He's essentially in prison. He's unable to communicate. But what happens at the end of the thousand years? Look at the end of verse 3. Well, let's just read the whole thing of verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till... So he's going to get another chance. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So what happens is, he's let out of the prison at the end of the thousand years. Look with me at verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired... Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So here's what happens. During the millennium, the Lord Jesus Christ sits on a throne in Jerusalem. He literally, physically reigns on the earth. Revelation says He rules with a rod of iron. So you know what happens during the millennium? When people rebel against the Lord's commandments, there is swift, just punishment. And in fact, it even appears to be the case that what happens is outside Jerusalem, if you read Isaiah 66, I'd encourage you to do this. It, it seems that what happens is outside Jerusalem, there's a portal that opens and it's possible to see down into hell. So people that rebel against the Lord, there are people that were already in hell, but there's people that rebel against the Lord Jesus Christ during the millennium and they're taken and they're cast into hell and, and people can see it. Now I realize that what happens today is people say, well, I don't believe hell really exists. And that is just whistling past the graveyard. Do you know what that means? In other words, that's the boastful trying to talk myself into it. I really want to believe this and so I pretend that it is, but in my heart of hearts, I know. You follow me? Well, during the millennium, you're not even going to be able to pretend because the fool that says there is no hell, his buddy says, well, see, look right here and don't step any further. There is. So what's going to happen during the millennium? Here's what I want you to get. Right now, everyone thinks, if only my party would win the next election, everything would be great. And the reality is, whoever you elect is going to be a sinner. Some sin worse than others. Not everything is morally equivalent. But neither, no one's going to fix the fundamental problems this earth has. I mean, just be honest about that. 
What happens during the millennium, you finally have a just government. It's perfect. It's righteous. It's holy. Do men like it? Here's what happens. Some like it. A lot don't. But the lot that don't are fearful to say anything about it because the guy that's the king rules with a rod of iron, and if you cross him, what does he do? He throws you into hell. What Revelation 27, 20 verse 7 reveals is this. Satan is loosed out of his pit for a little season because how do you separate the wheat from the tares? There's a lot of people in the millennium that are going along with the program not because they love the king. They fear what the king can do. So this is my commentary. You can decide whether you believe this or not. Satan's loose for a little season. It says he goes out to deceive the nations of the earth. Now when he does that, the number of whom is gathered together is as the sand of the sea. Shouldn't there be someone that says, guys, pause for a minute. The last time anyone attacked the Lord Jesus Christ, blood flowed for 200 miles. We should not do this. This is a suicide mission. Don't do this. And what happens? The hatred, the resentment of the Lord Jesus Christ in man's heart is so great that the number of whom that gather together is what? The sand of the sea. They go up to Jerusalem. We're going to show him. Look at verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. In other words, they encircled them. There's not going to be any getting away. We'll just surround them. We're going to kill them. Encompass the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and notice this. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So they encircle Jerusalem, they're going to kill him, and God just says, I got you right where I want you, and he just incinerates them. That's the, that's the separation of the wheat from the tares, right? The Lord needed a way to identify what are the folks in the millennium who are obeying because they honor, they desire the Lord's rule, and who are the folks that are secretly resentful of it? Satan gets out, he's loosed a little season, I'm sure he lies and says, I escaped, I busted out of prison, they couldn't hold me, you want to join me in my rebellion? We'll show them! What an insane mission that is. Okay. Back with me to Jude 4. Jude chapter 4. For there are certain men crept in awares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now notice this. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to focus on here for a minute. Is turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. If you teach people grace, that they're saved by grace through faith apart from works, someone is going to say to you, you think you could rob a bank and still go to heaven? To which the answer is, of course I think that. Because if I didn't think that, then that would mean I think that I'm saved by my works. But let's turn it around. If your standard of righteousness is simply not robbing banks, your standard is too low. You know, in other words, let's say you don't rob a bank. Does God therefore think you're holy and righteous? No. He's got a whole bunch of other requirements that men repeatedly violate. But here's what happens with grace. There are some that will 
turn grace into lasciviousness. In other words, what they'll say is, since God saves by grace, you can live any old way you want, and there's no consequences. Now that's false. Let me, let me just clarify this. Your salvation is grace and has nothing to do with works. Your works play no role in your salvation. But at the catching up of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 3, Romans 14, make absolutely clear that every believer goes through something called the judgment seat of Christ, and the believer's work is evaluated. So does it matter how you live? Yes, it doesn't matter for salvation, but it matters for reward. Look with me at Titus 2. Titus chapter 2. When people say grace means you can live any old way you want, they're ignoring what Scripture says on the subject. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Notice verse 12. Teaching us. So grace actually teaches you something teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, what grace actually teaches you to do is to live godly, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, but to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Let me put it this way. As a saved person, you're still going to give account. You don't, you, don't, you don't avoid that. You're still going to. And your life as a saved person is going to determine what your reward is. So does it matter how you live? Of course it does. Let me show you what happens here. This is, I, I, I think this is how people think about it. So let's call this end of the spectrum 0% righteousness. And let's call, that's the left side, and let's call the right side 100% righteousness. The way that people typically think about this, here's the way man thinks about it. Man figures out where he is on the spectrum, and then he says, this is the standard you have to meet. Right? Because what that does is, then he's okay with God, and all the people he doesn't like go to hell. Right? And so if you think you're over here, then you can draw the line there in your mind. Right? If you think you're over here, then you draw it there. And what happens is, people think about meeting God's judgment, about satisfying his standard of righteousness in, in, in that sense. Right? In other words, that you have to, you know, they recognize they're not perfect, but they're more good than bad. Here's the truth. Here's, here's what grace does. You know what God's standard of righteousness is? It's 100%. It's right there. So guess where all of humanity is? You're on the wrong side of that line. That's why you need to be saved by grace through faith. That's why you need what Christ did for you when he died on the cross. So the only way you can be saved is by grace. And then what happens is this. The rest of your life, how you live, is what the Lord evaluates at the judgment seat of Christ. Let, let me put it this way. So once you believe the gospel, you've resolved the great issue of life. You're going to heaven. That's fabulous. That's tremendous. But here's the next issue. I'll just say it. The vast majority of the church wastes most of their life. I mean, just it's clearly the case, right? The, the, we waste our time in, in things that are of no consequence, no importance, no eternal significance. And so, my encouragement would, would be to save people would simply be this: once you've resolved the issue of salvation, hallelujah, you've resolved the big issue of life. 
Now you work on the next item. And the next item is, how do you glorify the Lord in what you do during this life so that when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord rewards you for it. All right, one more thing on Jude and we'll stop. So look at Jude chapter 4 again. Chapter 4, I'm so sorry. Verse 4, Jude 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now notice this. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the realities of modern life is you can pray to God. You see this all the time. When you see governmental invocations where they start a meeting with prayer, no problem to speak of God. But it's a problem to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just how it is. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is the express image of His person. In other words, He's the true God. And of course, what people are comfortable with the, the broader abstract God that can mean all sorts of different things. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 11, or I'm sorry, verse 1, 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, this is just like Jude, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So what happens, this is specifically in reference to the, the last days of the 70th week, but there's the folks that deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They deny the Lord and what, what follows? Swift destruction is what Second Peter 2 verse 1 tells us. So let's just close with this. The, um, we're looking at Jude, of course, and Jude deals with the prophetic calendar. It deals with the last days. The relevance of this for us is that we're going to face some of the same things in terms of the doctrinal attacks upon the Word of God and the Gospel. They're out there, and it's, it's important for us to be in the Word, to be studying so that we know the truth and we don't fall prey to, to Satan's devices. And of course, the, the most important thing is just Understand the gospel. The Lord died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day. The moment you believe that, you're saved. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for these saints. Thank you for the opportunity to teach them. Thank you for the opportunity that we can fellowship together around your word. Thank you, Lord, that we don't suffer retribution for any of that. We pray, Lord, that you would give us opportunities in our lives to witness to the truth. We pray that we would be growing in grace and that we would be the ambassadors you want us to be. Lord, we just pray that uh, we would always have thankful hearts and that we would always have joyful attitudes because of what you have done for us. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.